Hello, everyone. My name is Ron Vale, the Executive Director of Genelia, the research campus of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. I would like to welcome you to Life Science Across the Globe, a Sister Institute seminar series. This series is open to viewers anywhere in the world. More information on the series is found on this slide, as well as the website lifesciencecrosstheglobe.org and videos of prior talks can be found on this website as well. Today, I would like to welcome the second Sister Institute, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and would like to welcome its director, Dr. Bruce Stillman. Thank you, Ron. Um, I want to welcome everybody to uh, this series and also to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories turn as one of the Sister Institutes. Um, I'm president of the laboratory, but uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Lamor Joshua Tor, who is the, um, going to be coordinating this series for Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, she uh, got her bachelor's uh, degree in chemistry at Tel Aviv University, and then a PhD at the Weizmann Institute, also in chemistry, and then did postdoctoral studies at Caltech before joining Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, where she's now a professor and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. And she's also former Dean of the Graduate School. So I want to uh, turn it over to Lamor, who will introduce the Cold Spring Harbor speakers. Thank you, Bruce, and welcome everybody. Hi from beautiful Cold Spring Harbor Lab right in, uh, behind me. Uh, I'm thrilled to introduce my colleague, uh, Mikola Egeblad, as our first speaker today. Uh, Mikola got her PhD in cancer biology from the University of Copenhagen and Denmark. She then moved to UCSF to work with the great Zena Werb, who unfortunately passed away just a few weeks ago. Um, then she began developing there, I should say, she began to develop uh, intravital spinning disc confocal microscopy to understand how the microenvironment influences tumor progression. Uh, she came to Cold Spring Harbor as an assistant professor and was then promoted to associate professor. At Cold Spring Harbor, she continues to study the tumor microenvironment and how that affects metastasis. She discovered the role of inflammation and neutrophil extracellular traps or NETs, uh, what, uh, their role uh, that they play in metastasis. Most recently, she discovered the role NETs are playing in COVID-19, and she's heading an international team to tackle this issue, which uh, may lead to, to treatments. Um, she received an Era of Hope Scholar Award from the DOD and the Pershing Square Sloan Prize for Young Investigators in Cancer Research. So thank you for that introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening. I'm gonna talk about NETs inflammation, what are NETs? NETs is short for neutrophil extracellular traps. And you can see them here on this first slide. These, uh, this smear of green stain is NETs in the lung of a uh, patient that uh, succumbed to COVID-19 here in New York. And I'm gonna uh, return to this image in the end of the talk. Because we didn't start looking at NETs in uh, COVID-19, we came from it by trying to understand the process of metastasis, spreading of cancer from a primary tumor, for instance, a breast, to uh, different tissues in the body, such as, for instance, a lung. So that these uh, tumor cells will leave the primary tumor, get into the vasculature, travel with the blood, and then uh, enter a, a second site. And there, these cells can then start uh, proliferating and forming metastasis, what we call the process of colonization. In terms of cancer patients, it is this metastatic uh, step that is the metastatic stage that's really hard to treat. The primary tumors can be surgically removed or treated other ways with radiation, but once you have metastasis, treatment is, is difficult. And my lab wanted to try to understand more about the colonization step to try to understand how to treat it better. We took a little bit unorthodox approach to get into that by using intravital imaging, uh, imaging in living mice, and we were um, helped by Max Krimmel at UCSF who had developed this long imaging technique. You can see here uh, the mice are intubated and there literally is a glass window uh, you can see through to get uh, into the lung and get images of what's going on there. So we did uh, images with 41 breast cancer cells. They're highly metastatic. We labeled them with red fluorescent protein and injected them intravenously into the mice and then watched uh, what was gonna happen as they reached the lung tissue. 
here using a mouse that's expressing GFP in the neutrophil population. What you're seeing here is over time that these, um, there's a uh, blue stain, DNA stain, we were using DAPI, and we have really used it only to get a counter stain for the lung tissue so we could see where we were. But you're seeing this development of clouds of DNA around some of these uh, metastatic cancer cells. So uh, it also overlapped with regions where we were seeing some of these green cells stop moving. So it was quite a peculiar, and we were wondering, of course, if it was the cancer cells that were dying and releasing their DNA. However, when we compared the metastatic 41 cancer cells that are able to form metastasis with a sister cell line 47 that are not able to form metastasis but die off upon injection, we actually found that the, these clouds of DNA were uh, almost always only found around the 41 cells as scored here blinded in a variety of, of these movies versus uh, in the 407 where we only found one example. Moreover, when we used a fluorescent probe against an enzyme called elastase, neutrophil elastase, this is a probe um, that only becomes fluorescent when the enzyme is activated. And you can see here, we see activity with the metastatic cells around this area of the cloud, but not with the non-metastatic cells. So what is this extracellular DNA with associated elastase activity? Well, I knew something about that only because I had been to a Keystone meeting uh, years earlier. So this was back in a time where we could go to real meetings and journals were being handed out. Um, here it's a journal from JCB that was handed out as a example. And I really remember this beautiful copper image of a neutrophil spilling out its uh, DNA into the extracellular space. And you can see here the bacteria that is uh, captured in this sticky DNA. And this is work by Otoro Solchinsky's group. They really discovered the nets originally in 2004. So what is now known is that uh, neutrophils, which is our most prevalent immune cell in, uh, in blood, uh, have three major means of uh, eliminating pathogens. They can do it through phagocytosis. Probably most of you have seen the classical movie where the uh, neutrophil is changing uh, through a petri dish like Pac-Man trying to capture bacteria. Um, they can also kill pathogens through degranulation, releasing these toxic enzymes to the extracellular space, and then they can form the neutrophil extracellular traps, the, the nets. They form these structures from activation of an enzyme called PET4, at least in most cases. PET4 um, citrullinates histones, leading to chromosome decondensation, and then this uh, DNA is associated with enzymes uh, otherwise found in the granuli, but enzymes like elastase or myeloid peroxidase. So you have an extracellular space DNA, granola enzymes, and the citrullinated histones. And that allows us to detect these nets in uh, tissue sections. So you can see here a faint uh, extracellular DNA around one of these uh, neutrophils, also a citrullinated histone, as well as uh, the myeloid peroxidase, one of these enzymes. Again, this is a high magnification view uh, from a lung of a COVID-19 patient. So neutrophils, as I mentioned, are capable of, of eating a phagocytosin pathogen genes. This is a movie of a neutrophil coming in here and you can see it phagocytosin bacteria in, in a mouse we have infected with um, red fluorescent bacteria. So why would they need neutrophil extracellular traps? That seemed to be a very efficient process. Well, this is an example of a movie uh, generated from a group in Germany that have uh, here uh, visualized what happens with the neutrophils encounter a larger pathogen, an aspergillus spore that's uh, labeled in blue. You can see this spore is uh, bigger than the neutrophils. Four or five of them are ganging up on it, but they can literally not uh, eat it. One of these neutrophils is now first condensing, then swelling up. And then propetomidite was added to the medium. So in a moment, you'll see this neutrophil exploding essentially and, and releasing its DNA to cover the, the spore. And so that is another way of, um, of uh, taking care of the pathogens. My students like to, to call this that the uh, neutrophils are spilling their guts. Uh, I prefer thinking of it like Spider-Man that's casting a, a sticky web to uh, capture the pathogens. But I will add that Spider-Man in this case commits suicide. The neutrophils do not survive this process. So we return back to our cancer cells. Uh, this is what neutrophils look like uh, in uh, scanning electron microscopy when they are left alone in culture. But here they've been exposed to the cancer cells and you can see that the cancer cells have hijacked this uh, um, system. They are expelling the um, 
the neutrophils are now expelling the uh, DNA strings. And we now know something about the cytokines that are doing that is, for instance, GCSF and other cytokines can, can uh, mediate this process. So the cancer cells can get neutrophils to form nets, but does it matter? So we were able to test this using nanoparticles coated with DNAs one to chop up literally these uh, um, DNA nets. And you can see here with control nanoparticles, there are metastasis all over in the lung of these mice. Um, but with the DNAs coated nanoparticles, the lungs are mostly clear. Also quantified over here is really a, a quite a striking difference uh, with this treatment. So this tells us that the nets are uh, important for metastasis, but how does it work? And um, the clue from that came from a, uh, a project we started around this time. We were trying to focus specifically on this step, on one, how one cell become to many cells in the case uh, of uh, the situation known as dormancy. You may know that some cancer patient uh, survivors can uh, live with their uh, cancer after what looks like a successful treatment for years or even decades, and then suddenly the cancer comes back. And it's quite unclear why the cancer can uh, be dormant for so long and what the signals are that then awaken it, as we call it. So we wanted to understand that, thinking that there was an opportunity for intervention. A new postdoc joined my lab around this time. He was watching uh, the lab meetings for the other project, and he started reasoning that if nets can be induced by the metastatic breast cancer cells to promote metastasis, maybe if uh, inflammation caused the nets to be formed, that could affect such dormant cancer cells that otherwise were sitting in the tissue and, and doing no harm. And so he set up a model system to test that using LPS or lipopolysaccharide, also known as endotoxin. It's a component of the bacterial wall of gram-negative bacteria. And he um, uh, got that into the airways of the mice to cause inflammation. You can see lots of neutrophils, they're forming nets. And if he inhibit the PAT4 enzyme that I mentioned, the neutrophils are coming in, but they're not forming nets. Similarly, he can uh, digest these nets with DNA's treatment. So he used this system in a context of a dormancy model, building on a model systems from many other groups, injecting the cancer cells with luciferase so he could track them, imaging every three days by bioluminescence, and then inducing inflammation at day seven. If he does that, you can see here in the control animals, there's no uh, uh, metastasis visible from, from bioluminescence. You can find single cells at the end, uh, but they are few and far be, um, between them, they're not proliferated. And with LPS, you have large uh, metastatic tumors and they are proliferating. This turned out to be uh, dependent on nets. Here he's tracking by bioluminescence. Again, the controls, there's uh, below the detection level. With LPS, the tumors are coming back, but treating with DNAs or PAD4, you can see a significant reduction and delay in uh, the occurrence of these metastases. How do the nets then cause awakening of dormant cancer? So to summarize a lot of data, uh, just in a cartoon, uh, what Sean found was mechanistically, what happens is these dormant cancer cells are sitting in the lung. They have their integrins, but they're not engaged. Neutrophils are coming in. They form the nets in response to inflammation. On the nets are two enzymes, the neutrophil elastase enzyme that we had detected with this uh, imaging probe, as well as matrix metalloproteinase 9. Together, they are cleaving a extracellular matrix protein called laminin, uh, changing the, the structure of this molecule so there now is an epitope reveal that can activate the integrin leading to um, proliferation of the cancer cells. So this led us to think, well, maybe there was some other external stimuli that can drive metastasis from disseminated cancer cells. Maybe this was more of a theme. And the um, uh, sort of clue to what that could be came from what really was a rather stressful event in my lab. We had a period where we had unreproducible, irreproducible results. A graduate student in my lab had worked on uh, the role of a gene called CCR2 in cancer cells. She had found over and over again for over years that the key phenotype was that these cancer cells grew very slowly. They were being controlled by the immune system compared here to the wild type cells. A few experiments needed to, uh, to be done before the story was completed. New postdoc came into the lab, repeats this experiment, and as you can see, sometimes you would even see the opposite she could not repeat this key phenotype of the project. As you can imagine, this was very frustrating. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out why countless of meetings going over the protocols, comparing line by line what could be wrong. And finally, after 10 months, 
I realized that I had forgotten to teach uh, Su Yang something important. We're getting our mice shipped to us uh, from Jackson Lab. It's about a 10 hour drive on Bombay Roads from uh, Jackson Lab to Cold Spring Harbor. And Su Yang, of course, wanted to finish these experiments as quickly as possible. So she took the mice more or less immediately out of these cages and started doing experiments. Of course, the mice looked something like this when they came out of these uh, boxes. And uh, incidentally, so did I at this point into the project. So Su Yang tried to see if it really was this stress of transportation that was uh, responsible. And as you can see here, when cancer cells were being injected in parallel either to mice that were straight out of the truck versus mice that had acclimatized for two weeks as they were supposed to, there was more than a doubling in tumor phenotype. So Yang and I realized that this was actually really interesting because chronic stress has been related to poor uh, cancer prognosis, but the mechanisms are not clear. There is a nice review here um, reviewing that the higher incidence and poor survival in a variety of different cancer are associated with, with stress. And transverse, uh, conversely, there is um, longer survival if you can socially support patients that are cancer survivors. Now we realized that maybe trucking of mice was not the best experimental model, so we teamed up with Linda Fennells, a neuroscientist here at uh, Cold Spring Harbor, and used a classical model of stress, the chronic restraint model, where the mice are sitting in conical uh, tubes for two hours every day and can't move, uh, which uh, stress them out, as it would do me too. So Yang built on this model, so she first inoculated uh, tumor cells into the mice in uh, the breast. That gave the um, time to the cancer cells to naturally disseminate to the lung. She surgically removed the tumors and then she started stressing the mice, similar to the stress that a cancer patient would have upon uh, being diagnosed with cancer. Finally, she evaluated metastasis. As you can see here, there was a huge effect on metastasis from these disseminated cells upon stress. It's about a fourfold increase in metastatic lesions and number of lesions. And as you can see in this uh, image, not only are there more lesions, these are the small lesions in the control. You can barely see them, but in the stress mice, they are much, much larger. Building on our previous work, Su Yang had the insight to measure nets in the plasma of these mice. Um, this can be done through an ELISA assay to detect DNA with bound enzymes uh, from these nets. And you can see that the net levels also increased about fourfold in the plasma of these mice. So uh, she uh, used again DNAs to try to digest these uh, nets. And as you can see, it reduces metastasis, it reduces the level of plasma nets, and uh, the lungs look much better. These mice can survive longer. Now, uh, of course, we uh, want to know a lot more about the mechanism. And uh, back in March, I was sitting and working on a grant to at least get to, to start to apply for money so we could uh, understand more about this mechanism. But I couldn't concentrate. I think like many of you, um, I was very stressed myself. Uh, and this is indeed why we are here today and watching this by Zoom instead of uh, meeting in person, because the COVID-19 um, pandemic was happening. And I was starting to think, well, maybe NETS had something to do with COVID-19. And reaching out to people I knew had worked on this uh, area, turned out that I was not the only one that had this idea. We were a large group of people that connected via Twitter, via emails, via personal connections. All of us had had the same idea. These NETS could have a role in uh, COVID-19. And we put out a perspective in Journal of Experimental Medicine early April to um, explain our rationale for this. The reason is that nets have been shown uh, in a variety of studies to um, be associated with acute respiratory distress syndrome, which you see in severe COVID-19. They see uh, a combination of mucus in cystic fibrosis mediated by nets, and that's also seen in COVID-19. There's a variety of cardiovascular diseases that's linked with elevated nets, and of course, then there's thrombosis, something we now understand is uh, very much uh, part of the um, pathogenesis of COVID-19. And that's there are known to play a major role in uh, types of uh, thrombosis. So we stuck our, net, uh, our necks out to say that there was a possible role for COVID-19, but we really didn't know at this point. Are there nets in COVID-19? Well, I was uh, very delighted and uh, excited when uh, early Thursday morning, I got a text from my uh, colleague and now friend, Andrew Weber, that is treating uh, COVID-19 patients here in Long Island in the Northwell Health um, 
system. They, uh, Northwell Health and uh, Cornell and the other um, in hospitals here in New York were sharing pathologies reports and one of the first cases were being um, evaluated by Dr. Alan Borsuk, shared with Northwell's pathologist and what he had seen was it was surprisingly neutrophilic. Uh, there was neutrophil debris in this case and when I hear neutrophil debris of course I'm thinking nets. So I contacted Elaine uh, Borsak and within hours he had sent me examples of uh, this uh, um, histology and he also sent us uh, three cases where we could stain for nets and as you can see here in all three cases there were simply nets everywhere and along from these uh, patients that had succumbed uh, to COVID-19. Um, you can see here example of, of the double staining for myeloid peroxidase and the um, citrullinated histone that is marking neutrophils in the process of forming nets. I also really want to highlight the fellows that did the actual um, autopsies. Many places not able to do the autopsies due to the risk of infection. Um, so, so this was done by some risk to them uh, personally, and I really very much appreciate that. In addition to finding nets in the lungs, uh, members of this network, um, Jason Knight, Jogan Kanfi, and Ray Shu, uh, were able to quickly um, get remnant serum, serum samples that had been taken as part of the clinical course and otherwise were going to be thrown out, and measuring again using this ELISA assay for DNA conjugated with myeloid peroxidase, measuring the remnant serum that there were indeed elevated level of nets in the COVID-19 patients. Moreover, they could see that the patients that were on ventilation versus those that could stay on room air had the highest levels of NETs. This was done very rapidly and communicated rapidly, even though the samples were perhaps not ideal, because they really wanted uh, the information to be spread to the community. In parallel, uh, Christian Cognos group at Utah, a uh, scientist I had just had dinner with in February when I was visiting um, the Huntsman Cancer Institute, were able to quickly um, repurpose one of his IRB protocols. And um, Beth Middleton, her fellow, was able to go and consent the patients and collect fresh plasma. These are really the sample you want to look at to prove to yourself that NETs are important. And you can see here, she found a very consistent result with that early report. Uh, intubated patients at the highest levels, and when they got better, the level of nets dropped down. Importantly, the patients that uh, succumbed to COVID-19 had the highest level of nets in blood. So what are the nets doing? We think that one of the way things they're doing is forming microclots, uh, microthrombi, um, in, in the blood. You can see here uh, that uh, when we stain for uh, platelet factor 4, there are microthrombi in the lung. This is from case 3, and they are positive for neutrophils in the process of forming um, nets, citrullinated histone, and myeloid peroxidase is present there. So based on this, we are proposing to target nets in COVID-19. Uh, this is examples of, of uh, ways of targeting nets that are ongoing in, in clinical trials. You can target nets with DNA, so several trials ongoing with that. We have tried it in um, a couple of patients locally in Long Island and have a case report out on that. Uh, you can try to target the mechanism responsible for induction of nets. It's not clear what it is with COVID-19. It's clear there's something in blood that can induce it. And one candidate is R1 beta based on, on work from, um, from many other studies on nets pre-COVID-19. And a Kinra is a drug that can be used to target IL-1 beta and case reports have suggested that that actually has some efficacy in severe cases. Now you can also target neutrophils as well as other inflammatory um, factors with colchicine, an old drug used in rheumatology. Again, uh, case reports are suggesting that under the right circumstances, this actually works. And then um, very intriguingly, uh, Jogan Kanfi and Jason Knight's group have um, proposed that dipyrimidol, an, an old plate antiplatelet drug, can be used because it inhibits both the platelets and the nets, um, the formation of nets, and this way really target these microthrombi. So all of these approaches are in clinical trials, uh, randomized, and hopefully we will know within a few months if any of it works. So with that, I'd like to conclude by really saying that for, for the role of nets in metastasis, we now know from a variety of different mouse models, starting with work by um, uh, John Kohlslatik, John Spicer, and others in, uh, at McGill, we really were the first to show nets playing a role in metastasis, and in animal models, uh, I think we can feel kind of confident that they can drive metastasis.
In humans, we are starting to see uh, strong studies linking the presence of NETs with uh, tumor stage of poor uh, prognosis. Of course, in the animal experiments, we can tag, target the nets that I've shown you, but have we really proven that they play a role in in vivo? And I must admit that the approaches we have taken, I showed you DNA's treatment or inhibition of PET4, but they, we have also used inhibition of other molecules important for uh, net formation. None of these approaches are uh, in, uh, honestly uh, specific for nets. Uh, the reason we, we still uh, believe that the evidence is there is because there's so many different approaches targeting nets give the same result. Nevertheless, I think the field uh, really recognizes that we need basic discovery science to determine exactly how the nets are formed and uh, how they work so we can better target them. And this is something, of course, uh, there is a huge effort to do. I should add that one of the complications is that nets, uh, that neutrophils only survive six to 24 hours in culture. So a lot of standard techniques cannot be used. I want to just end by saying that what we are learning in one disease, everybody coming together uh, to try to understand COVID-19, I think will end up helping us as we go back to our, uh, our uh, primary research areas like cancer, locals, antiphospholipid syndrome, cardiovascular disease, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. It's been extremely um, uh, valuable, I think, to have so many different views on how NETS works. Um, in this group and it's something I'm enjoying a lot. And with that, I wanna thank the people that did the work. I mentioned the people in my lab that did a lot of the COVID-19 work and stress work, Su Yang and David, Shang El uh, did uh, work on dormancy. And I wanna give a shout out to uh, Juwan, Bobby and Laura that did the first work on metastasis in my lab. As you can imagine, uh, studying these uh, DNA structures was highly controversial at the time. I want to thank my uh, collaborators at Cold Spring Harbor, particularly Linda Van Elst and Tobias Janovich, who's working uh, with me on some of the COVID-19 stuff, and my different collaborators on the COVID-19 uh, projects. Uh, and here, of course, my group. We are socially distancing, but we have a shift around 2 p.m. when this photo was taken. One of our lab members, unfortunately, is stuck in Germany, and we look forward to having her back eventually. Finally, I want to thank the patients, uh, family, the families that were uh, allowing us to uh, get access to, um, to the long of these uh, COVID-19 cases. Um, it was really helpful to try to understand the uh, pathophysiology of this disease, and um, I thank them for that. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'll be delighted to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michaela. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I think that um, it was uh, some really exciting and elegant studies that you showed. Um, and I think we're all looking forward to hearing how the um, clinical trials work out, particularly in um, COVID-19. Um, the first question I have for you is, um, you know, this mechanism of extruding DNA into the extracellular environment and net formation is, is do you know, is, is something like this um, evolutionarily conserved? And is, is it seen in other um, animals, organisms, plants? It is seen in, in other organisms and plants, even um, one of the slides I took out to stay on time uh, was uh, showing an example of extrusion of, of DNA in plants uh, to protect plants from uh, bacteria in the soil. So it seems to be as a um, very conserved mechanism. And one of the things that's been proposed is that the histones actually can be toxic to um, pathogens when present in the extracellular space. Excellent. So we have a ton of um, great questions also from our audience. I'm gonna call in a few people um, and see if they're willing to ask their questions to you directly. I'm gonna start with um, Gurud Gurudat Patra. Gurudat, are you there? Would you like to ask your question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Mikhaila, for the wonderful presentation. And uh, my question is, uh, how much time does neutrophils take to reach the site of inflammation? And is there any de uh, deciding factor for nets to be formed or not? So your like question was, how much time does it take them to, to uh, reach the site of inflammation? I think it really depends. Sometimes you can see it in the intervital imaging. Um, within 20 minutes, uh, and sometimes it is um, it takes longer. They have different chemokines to recruit them, and different signaling uh, peptides to recruit them. So it depends a little bit on the mechanism, but it can be as early as 20 minutes. 
And once they are there, they have uh, different pathways that, that can lead to formation of nets. One pathway, it takes maybe um, just minutes and another pathway it takes hours. And we also see both um, processes uh, in vivo. Thank you. Um, we also have a question from Yvonne Sun. Yvonne, are you there? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering, so with uh, uh, for people with cystic fibrosis that suffer long-term and chronic inflammation, are they a higher risk for lung cancer then? Um, I don't know that that is uh, clear. There is um, a link with uh, lung fibrosis, um, so not cystic fibrosis, but lung fibrosis, where we also know that there are a lot of nets. They do have a higher risk of, um, of lung cancer. Cystic fibrosis is a little, um, little trickier. They also at least tended to die earlier, younger, before they might be able to develop the, um, the cancer. Great, thank you. Um, we do also have a question from Eric Zhao, which I'm going to read. Um, what substance derived from the 4T1 tumor cells is responsible for triggering net formation um, within the tumor niches? So uh, we identified a granulocytic colony stimulating factor as one of the substances. Um, it's probably not working alone. We think that there might be um, at least two factors working together to get optimal response. But um, targeting uh, GCSF, colonocytic stimul colony stimulating factor, can re dampen the response. Um, other studies have, have uh, verified that. There's also chemokines like uh, CXCL8 in humans or CXCL2 that's been linked to net formation. Great, thank you. Um, we also have a good question from um, Abhishek Bardhan. Uh, let's see. Abhishek, are you there? Would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. I was just wondering how do the neutrophils uh, actually decide which pathway is to be turned on during the uh, immune response? Like, uh, it, is, uh, it has to turn on the phagocytosis pathway or the, or the net formation. How does it decide? I think, so you were a little hard to hear, but I think the question was how did the neutrophil decide whether to do phagocytosis, degranulation, or net formation? Correct. So um, it's not entirely clear, but some of it seems to be that um, they can uh, sense whether or not uh, the, the pathogen is too big to be eaten. So uh, size is a factor. Uh, they have sensors for that. Another uh, potential um, mechanism is uh, that some bacteria has uh, developed ways to avoid being phagocytosed. And so those bacteria can then be uh, taken up by nets. And then uh, conversely, some bacteria actually express DNases themselves. And so those uh, would be better uh, taken up by phagocytosis and by, um, by uh, net formation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we also have a question here um, from Pat Ting. Um, Pat, are you there? Would you like to answer, ask your question? If not, that's fine. I will go ahead and ask it um, on behalf of Pat. Um, Pat was wondering, um, the DNAs that are extruded out from the neutrophils, are they somehow modified to, to, to become even more sticky? Yeah, probably. So there's this citrullination of the histones that is modified. But another question is, of course, is there any specific uh, sequences that is um, um, increased on, on these nets, is it just random genomic DNA that's out or are there sp specific DNA sequences? This is something we are looking into right now with um, a collaborator at Cold Spring Harbor, Tom Gingeris, where we're trying to sequence what is actually the DNA and what is the nature of the DNA. Thanks, and also um, a follow-up question from Pat was, um, is there any way uh, to differentiate extracellular DNA found in coronavirus infected um, samples, um, although I lost the question. Uh, um, so is there any way to differentiate extracellular DNA found in coronavirus infected samples as the DNAs, for example, the nets spilled out by neutrophil and the DNA spilled out from cells dead um, accidentally that are other than neutrophils, for example, like in necrosis? 
Yes, so, so um, a major way of looking at that is uh, whether or not uh, myeloid peroxidase or neutrophil elastase is associated with the DNA. If it's just spilled out from, from a cell that doesn't have those enzymes, they're not, uh, the enzymes are not found in the DNA. Uh, citrullinated histone is also fairly specific to um, a net forming um, a cell compared to a, a cell that's just dying from necrosis. So those right are being used to measure nets and plasma. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Michaela, I think that is all the time we have right now for questions, but um, I wanna direct everybody to our Slack channel and I will put a um, link to it in the webinar chat so that you can all head over there and um, ask um, additional questions and have more conversation.